Volume Three, Chapter Seven of That Unfortunate Marriage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That Unfortunate Marriage by Francis Eleanor Trollope, Volume Three, Chapter Seven. It was not until Owen had nearly reached Collingwood Terrace that the thought struck him: What if Mister Bragg should withdraw his countenance from him and dismiss him from his employment when he learned that he was betrothed to May? The idea of Mr. Bragg in the light of a rival disconcerted and confused all his previous conceptions of his employer. At the first blush it had appeared ludicrous, incredible, but on reflection there was, he found, nothing so extravagant in it. Mr. Bragg had a right to seek a wife to please himself. He was but little past middle life, after all, and as to the disparity in years between him and May, that was certainly not unprecedented. He had taken his rejection well and manfully, even with a touch of chivalry, but he might not any the more be disposed to continue his favour towards owen when he should discover the state of the case he might even suspect that there had been some kind of plot to deceive him that was a very uncomfortable thought and sent the blood tingling through owen's veins there was clearly but one thing to be done to tell mr bragg the truth at all hazards as he walked along the pavement within a few hundred yards of mrs bransby's door he reflected that the revelation would come better and more gracefully from may than from himself he was not supposed to be aware of what had passed between may and mr bragg it was best that he should still seem to ignore it he had a sympathetic sense that mr bragg's wounded feelings might endure may's delicate handling while they would shrink resentfully from any masculine touch owen regretted now more than ever that he had not seen may again before leaving her aunt's house they had had no time to consult together or to form any plan of action for the future their interview seemed in owen's recollection to have passed like a swift gleam of light in a sky over which the clouds are flying it had in sober fact lasted above half an hour before mrs dormer smith's appearance on the scene and now he was forbidden the house forbidden to see her and yet he told himself over and over again that he could not have acted otherwise than he had acted at the time well it was too absurd to suppose that she could be treated as a prisoner they must meet soon and meanwhile there was a penny post in the land and her letters at least would not be tampered with he would write to her the moment he got home she would receive his letter the next morning and by that same afternoon she could put mr bragg in possession of the fact of her engagement and after she had done so the afterwards seemed hazy certainly but at least there was no doubt as to the plain duty of both of them not to keep their engagement any longer secret from mr bragg it was a comfort to see clearly the right course as regarded the steps immediately before them for the rest they had youth and hope and they loved each other owen let himself into the house with his latch-key and went straight to his own room to write to may when the note was finished he took it out and posted it and then proceeded to the sitting-room the table was spread for tea and all the tea equipage bright and glistening as cleanliness could make it a cheerful fire burned in the grate bobby and billy seated side by side on a couple of low stools in one corner were occupied with a big book full of coloured pictures ethel was sewing martin stood leaning against the mantelpiece close to his mother's armchair and in a chair at the opposite corner of the hearth sat mr bragg with enid on his knee when owen entered mr bragg said well mr rivers you see i found my way to mrs bransby's i ought to have come and paid her my respects before now but you know i've had my hands pretty full since i came back to england something in his tone and his look seemed to convey a hint to be silent as to their conversation of that morning and accordingly owen made no allusion to it it is so pleasant to see an old chester face is it not said mrs bransby some old chester faces returned owen laughing then he said well enid have you not a word to say to me won't you come and give me a kiss miss enid who was a born coquette and who was moreover greatly interested in mr bragg's massive watch chain and seal replied with imperious brevity no i don't want to mr bragg looked down gravely on the small creature and then up at owen as he said half shyly and yet with a certain tinge of complacency why well, she would come and sit on my knee almost the first minute she saw me perhaps you'd better get down baby said mrs bransby i'm afraid she may be troublesome troublesome lord no why i don't feel she's there no more than a fly let her bide said mr bragg ah i know what she is she's fickle observed owen drawing up his chair not pickle declared miss enid with great majesty yes you are false fleeting perjured enid said owen he was delighted to perceive that the little home and its inmates had evidently made a favourable impression on mr bragg observing that gentleman in the new light of may's revelation 
he saw something in his face which he had not seen there before a regretful far-away look whenever he was not speaking or being spoken to it was wonderfully strange certainly to think of him as may's wooer and yet not absurd as it had appeared at first in mr bragg's presence the absurdity somehow vanished the simplicity and reality of the man gave him dignity owen even began to feel something like a vague and respectful compassion for mr bragg and every now and then the peculiarity of their mutual position would come over him with a fresh sense of surprise we have been having a little conversation mrs bransby and me about her boy here said mr bragg glancing across at martin who coloured and smiled with repressed eagerness mr bragg continued to observe him thoughtfully he tells me he wants to help his mother and he's not afraid or ashamed of work it seems ashamed broke out martin no i hope i ain't such a cad as that martin cried his mother anxiously she was nervous lest he should give offence but mr bragg answered with a little nod which certainly did not express disapprobation well the boy's about right to be ashamed of the wrong things does belong to what you might call a cad i expect pursued mr bragg musingly that if we could always apply our shame in the right place we should all of us do better than we do i suppose i dare not offer you any tea at this hour said mrs bransby gently you have not dined of course well no not under the name of dinner i haven't but i ate a hearty luncheon and i believe that's about as much dinner as i want to do me any good you know i'll have a cup of tea please mrs bransby certainly felt no misapplied shame as to the humbleness and poverty of her surroundings and was far too truly a gentlewoman to think of apologizing for them ethel who was growing to be quite a notable little housewife quietly fetched another cup and saucer from the kitchen and that was all the difference which mr bragg's presence made in the ordinary arrangements enid insisted on having her high chair placed close to mr bragg at table and but for her sister's watchful interposition she would have demonstrated her sudden affection for him by transferring sundry morsels of bread and butter which she had been tightly squeezing in her small fingers from her plate to his with the patronizing remark oh we'll have dat i can't eat any more while the meal was still in progress there came a knock on the street door it was a very peculiar knock consisting of two or three sharp raps followed by one solemn rap and then after an appreciable interval by several more hurried little raps as if the hand at the knocker had forgotten all about its previous performances and were beginning afresh who can this be said mrs bransby looking up in surprise visitors at any time were rare with her now and at that hour unprecedented old butcher come back to say he can't live without us suggested martin whereupon bobby and billy with consternation in their faces exclaimed simultaneously oh i say and enid perceiving the general attention to be diverted from her took that opportunity to polish the bowl of her spoon by rubbing it softly against mr bragg's coat sleeve the family were not kept long in suspense as soon as the door was opened a well-known voice was heard saying volubly ah oh, a tea are they well never mind take in my card if you please and dear me i haven't got one but if you will kindly say an old friend from the old chester begs leave to wait on mrs bransby why it's simmy cried the children starting up and rushing to the door here's a lark exclaimed bobby while billy tugging at the visitor's skirt roared out hospitably come along mother's in there come in mother here's simmy mrs sebastian box simpson it was she appeared on the threshold rubicund visage glittering spectacles filmy curls and girlish giggles all as usual and began to apologize for what she called her unauthorized yet perhaps not wholly inexcusable intrusion with her old amiability and incoherency she had come prepared to keep up a cheerful mien having decided in her own mind not to distress the feelings of the family by any lachrymose allusions but when mrs bransby rose up to welcome her and not only took her by the hand but kissed her on the cheek and led her towards the place of honour in the armchair this proceeding so overcame the kind-hearted creature that she abruptly turned her back on them all pulled out her pocket-handkerchief and burst into tears i really must apo apologize she sobbed still presenting the broad back of a very smart shawl to the company an attitude which made her elaborate politeness extremely comical for she addressed her speech point-blank to the wallpaper with abundance of bows and gestures i am ashamed indeed pray excuse me the suddenness of the emo emotion and the sight of the dear children coupled with i believe a slight touch of the prevalent influenza but nothing in the least infectious dear mrs bransby but pray do not allow me to disturb the harmony of this fest festive meeting with the most admired disorder as our immortal bard puts it although what there is to admire in disorder and who admired it must probably remain forever ambiguous <laughs> 
by the end of this speech the utterance of which had been interrupted by several interludes of pocket-handkerchief mrs simpson was sufficiently composed to turn round and take the chair offered to her the children were grinning undisguisedly simmy was associated in their minds with many pleasant and many comical recollections mrs bransby was smiling too but perhaps it was only the warning spectacle of mrs simpson's emotion which enabled her to choke down her own inclination to cry this is a most pleasant surprise she said when did you arrive in london why the fact is began amelia but suddenly interrupting herself she jumped from her seat and made mr bragg a sweeping curtsey pardon me she exclaimed if in the first moment i was oblivious to your presence although not personally acquainted all chester people claim the privilege of recognising mr bragg as one of our native products an unforeseen honour indeed and do my eyes deceive me or have i the pleasure of greeting mr owen rivers what an extraordinary coincidence i had heard you were residing here in the character of a boarder she added as emphatically as though that were an obvious reason for being surprised to see him there really i seem to be transported back into our ancient city and should scarcely start to hear the cathedral chimes or the steam whistle from the brewery or any of the dear familiar sounds although the steam whistle i must admit is trying and in certain forms of nervous disorder i believe excruciating it was not easy at any time to obtain a clear and collected answer to a question from mrs simpson but in her present state of excitement the difficulty was immensely increased her language, partly in honour of Mr. Bragg, was so flowery, and she kept darting up every discursive cross-alley which opened out of the main line of talk in so bewildering a fashion as to become at moments unintelligible, and it was a long time before any of the party elicited from her how it was that she came to be in London. At length, however, it appeared that Bassie was entrusted with a commission to buy a pianoforte, and having found a substitute to take his organ and attend his pupils for a week, he and his wife had suddenly resolved to take a holiday in london together i had of course intended to seek you out dear mrs bransby she said ever mindful as i must be of the many kind favours i have received from you and here she gulped dangerously but recovered herself and went on from all the family but we came away in such a hurry at the last a cheap excursion train being in fact our immediate motive locomotive put in martin jocosely quite so said amelia with the utmost suavity a very proper correction then seeing his mischievous face dimpling with laughter she exclaimed of course locomotive very good martin ah i am as absent as ever you see here she playfully shook her head until sundry metallic bobs upon her bonnet fell off and had to be hunted for and picked up well so it was i was hurried away by bassie's impetuosity although in justice to him i must state that the time bills were peremptory and there was no margin for delay or deliberation almost without a carpet-bag i had no opportunity therefore of inquiring of any mutual friend in oldchester for your address there are scarcely any who know it or care to know it said mrs bransby in a low voice oh pardon me dear mrs bransby no no that must not be said for the honour of old chester your memory is affectionately cherished by all the more refined and sympathetic souls among us only last week mr crump the butcher was respectfully inquiring for news of you you remember crump a worthy man whose spirit notwithstanding the dictum of the swan of avon is by no means subdued to what it works in beyond a transient greasiness which lies merely on the surface yes i remember him very well but who then was it who directed you to this house asked mrs bransby hoping that her guest was not aware why martin had suddenly retired behind the window curtains in a paroxysm of laughter ah that again is one of the most extraordinary circumstances who do you think it was i cannot tell at all guess miss piper perhaps suggested ethel not exactly miss piper said mrs simpson with a strong emphasis on the qualifying adverb as though her informant's identity were only barely distinguishable from that of miss piper but you burn ethel you're very near however i will not keep you longer in suspense it was miss clara bertram oh i might have thought of her for she is a neighbour of ours said mrs bransby is she asked owen yes she lives in a house with a rather good garden not far from here the situation is a little inconvenient for her profession i fancy but she has invalid relatives to whom the garden is a great boon we met accidentally in the street one day and she recognised me at once i was surprised that she did so nay i should rather have been surprised had she forgotten you said mrs simpson for the heart dear mrs bransby that once truly loves never forgets but as fondly loves on to the not of course that there was anything beyond the very slightest acquaintance between you and miss bertram in oldchester bassy is in fact at her house now with a few musical professors whom she kindly invited us to meet the artistic element which is so akin to bassy's soul combined with the seductions of the indian weed of which miss bertram's papa is quite a devotee so that you see 
finding you are so near i slipped away to see you and i have promised to return before it is time to go back to the boarding-house where we are staying at this point mr bragg got up to take his leave i shall look in again before long mrs bransby if you'll allow me he said and we'll have a little more talk about my young friend there good night to you ma'am turning to shake hands with mrs simpson this brought that lady to her legs in more senses than one she favoured mr bragg with a long and enthusiastic address embracing an extraordinary variety of topics from the proud pre-eminence of british commerce to the force of friendship as portrayed in the classical examples of damon and pythias i will not ask in the beautiful words of the caledonian ditty should old acquaintance be forgot and days of old lang syne for i am certain that you are entirely incapable of doing anything of the sort as is proved by your presence beneath this refined roof-tree said mrs simpson but i must bear my humble testimony to the eminent virtues of our exquisite friend if i may be allowed the privilege of calling her so i have seen her basking in prosperity and unspoiled by the smiles of fortune and now in the cold shade of comparatively untoward circumstances she beams with the same congenial lustre in short cried amelia suddenly abandoning what bobby and billy called her dictionary style for a homelier language which came straight from her heart a better wife and mother a gentler mistress a kinder friend than never was or could be in this world owen offered to accompany mr bragg in order to show him the way to the nearest cab-stand and they left the house together she's a singular character observed mr bragg after they had walked a few steps you mean mrs simpson oh yes mrs simpson there's too much clack about her and her talk's puzzling from being what you might call of a zigzag sort of nature and she's cast in a queer kind of a mould altogether but i think she rings true and that's the main thing in mortals or metals i'm quite sure her praise of mrs bransby is true at any rate said owen warmly hm grunted mr bragg and walked on in silence when they came within view of a cab stand he turned round and said he would not trouble owen to come any further with him and just as the latter was about to say good-night mr bragg observed meditatively she has that little place beautifully neat and as clean as a new pin seems to be bringing up those children in the right way too poor soul it's a heavy charge for a delicate lady like her i think i shall be able to do something for that eldest boy but perhaps you'd better not say anything at present eh it's cruel to raise up false hopes and some folks build such a wonderful high scaffolding of expectations on a word or two if there's not bricks enough to do anything adequate to the scaffolding why then that's awkward good night mr rivers owen well knew that hopes had already been aroused by the mere presence of the rich man in that poor little home but he knew also that there was no danger of mrs bransby's hopes turning into claims and that she would be humbly grateful for very small help he felt almost elated on her behalf as he returned to collingwood terrace i only hope he said to himself that mr bragg won't visit any of my sins on mrs bransby's head when he finds them out but no to do the old boy justice i believe he is above that meanwhile amelia simpson had been imparting a budget of old chester news after many discursive sallies she came to the topic of lucius cheffington's recent death he had died since the simpson's departure from old chester but his case had been known to be hopeless for several days previous the old lord was said to be dreadfully cut up more so even than on the death of his eldest son but lucius had always been understood to be his father's favourite and they do say continued mrs simpson that to a certain fair young friend of ours the blow will be very severe a young friend of ours do you mean may cheffington oh no our dear miranda knew scarcely anything of her noble relative at combe park and even the most affectionate disposition and i am sure our dear miranda is imbued with every proper feeling can scarcely cling with personal devotion to an almost total stranger although united by ties of kindred no i was speaking of miss hadlow constance yes although i have never been on terms to address her by her baptismal appellation that i confess is the young lady i do mean then mrs simpson went on to tell her astonished listener how that constance hadlow had been visiting some county magnates in the near neighbourhood of combe park during the latter part of lucius's illness how she had been admitted to see and talk with the invalid when other persons had been excluded with scant courtesy how she had rapidly come to be on a footing of intimacy at the great house which astonished the neighbourhood and how at length that fact was explained by the current report that if lucius had recovered which at one time appeared not unlikely he would have married her with his father's full approbation i did not venture to allude to the subject before mr rivers how brown he has become quite the southern hero of romance because you know he was said at one time to be desperately in love with his cousin and i feared to hurt his feelings 
oh i don't think it would hurt his feelings said mrs bransby i really do not believe he cares at all for his cousin in that way i am sure he doesn't cried ethel who took a thoroughly feminine interest in the subject ethel i scarcely think you know anything at all about the matter and i am sure it is not for a little girl like you to give an opinion no mother only martin and i know who we should like to see him marry don't we martin martin was rather shamefaced at being thus brought publicly into the discussion and rebuffed his sister with a lofty air oh don't talk bosh and silliness he rejoined girls are always bothering about a fellow's getting married leave him alone he's very well as he is he's certainly most affable and thoroughly the gentleman observed mrs simpson with her universal beaming benevolence oh he is good cried the widow clasping her hands so delicately considerate such a true loyal friend in her own mind in her own mind she was convinced that mr bragg's visit was entirely due to owen's influence and her heart was overflowing with gratitude a new idea darted into mrs simpson's imagination always ready to accept a romantic view of things how charming it would be if young mr rivers were to marry the beautiful widow they would make a delightful couple considerations of ways and means entered no more into mrs simpson's calculations than they would have entered into little enid's the building of her castles in the air was entirely independent of money but there was at bottom a more common sensible reason which made the idea that owen might marry mrs bransby agreeable to amelia simpson in spite of the sympathy of mr crump the butcher and other congenial spirits it could not be denied that some rumours of a very unpleasant sort had recently been circulated in oldchester to the discredit of mrs bransby when it became known that young rivers on his return from spain was to live in her house the rumours began to take more definite shape no one could trace them to their source perhaps no one tried very seriously to do so people asked each other if they had not always thought there was something a little odd not quite becoming and nice in the way that young rivers used to be running in and out of martin bransby's house at all times and seasons even during poor mr bransby's lifetime strange things had been said at least it now appeared so for very few of the gossips professed to have heard any whispers of scandal themselves while martin lived there was a strange story of young rivers being caught kissing mrs bransby's hand in the garden there might be no harm in kissing a lady's hand but under the circumstances there was something almost revolting was there not and then why was mrs bransby in such a hurry to run away from oldchester away from all her friends and all her husband's friends surely she would have done better to remain there at all events mr theodore bransby had been much annoyed by her doing so and had replied to old friends who spoke to him on the subject that he could not control his stepmother's actions could only advise her for the best and should endeavour to assist her and her children if she would allow him to do so of course people understood when he said that that mrs bransby was acting contrary to his judgment and now mr rivers was actually going to reside in her house it positively was not decent no wonder theodore looked distressed and avoided the subject it must be altogether a very painful affair for him this kind of scandal with its inevitable crescendo had been very differently received by sebastian simpson and his wife he could not be said to encourage it but neither did he repudiate it indignantly but amelia was true and devoted to mrs bransby and incurred some unpopularity by her enthusiastic praises of that absent lady but there were also people who said what a good creature mrs simpson was and that although she was a goose and had probably been quite taken in they liked to see her stand up for those who had been kind to her under these circumstances it was a great triumph for amelia to find mr bragg the respectable the influential the rich mr bragg visiting mrs bransby on a friendly footing and treating her with marked kindness and respect simple though she might be amelia was not at all too simple to understand that the millionaire's approbation would carry weight with it but now the idea of a marriage between owen and the widow seemed still more delightful than the mere clearing of mrs bransby's character from all aspersions people had said that as for him the young man was probably suffering under a temporary infatuation and that even supposing the best and taking the most charitable view of this flirtation it was out of the question that he should think of marrying a woman of mrs bransby's age and with five children to support why should it be out of the question amelia said to herself the few years difference in their ages was of no consequence at all and as to the family mr bragg would probably take owen into partnership he was evidently devotedly fond of them both she had privately arranged the details of the wedding in her own mind before owen returned from conducting mr bragg to his cab when he did so mrs simpson declared it was time for her to go and got up from her chair but between that and her actual departure a great many words had still to intervene she reverted to the death in the castlecombe family 
made a brief excursion to the report of captain sheffington's second marriage truly deplorable but still our dear miranda is happily launched among the elite of the beau monde so perhaps it is not so bad after all and then suddenly added by the way dear mrs bransby it was reported that your stepson mr theodore intended to withdraw his candidature at the next election but i am told on the best authority mr low the political agent that that is a mistake so i hope we may see him among the legislators quite the figure for it i am sure however of course you must know all that news far better than i i hope to see our dear miranda before leaving town owen observed with indignation that the mention of theodore appeared to have suggested may to her mind nor did this circumstance escape mrs bransby did you say you shall see may sheffington she asked yes i propose calling although well aware of mrs dormer smith's high social position still i think our dear miranda's warm heart will welcome one who has so recently seen her beloved grandmamma oh we do not easily relinquish the fond memories of childhood thank you my dear ethel is that my pocket-handkerchief really i wonder how it came there ethel had picked it up from under the tea-table i believe that even in the princely halls i think i left my umbrella in the passage eh oh bobby has found it in the princely halls of castlecombe her memory will revert to friar's row in the words of the poet those strangers may roam those hills and those valleys i once called my home although of course old chaucer is not mountainous and as to roaming i presume that hills and valleys are always more or less liable to be roamed over by strangers whether one calls them one's home or not by this time mrs simpson had got herself out of the room into the narrow outer passage and seeing owen put on his great coat again in order to escort her she stopped to protest against his taking that trouble oh pray too kind it is but a stone's throw from here and i am not at all afraid sure of the way well no not quite sure i took two wrong turnings in coming but i can easily inquire from marlborough house eh on blenheim lodge is it to be sure marlborough house is the august residence however historically speaking i was not so far wrong was i well if you insist mr rivers i will accept your polite attention with gratitude good-bye once more dear children if i possibly can come again before leaving london dear mrs bransby at this point owen perceived that decisive measures were necessary if the good lady's farewells were not to last until midnight he took mrs simpson's arm signed to phoebe to open the door and led his fair charge outside it almost before she knew what was happening excuse me for hurrying you he said but the night is cold mrs bransby is not very strong and i thought it imprudent for both of you to stand talking in that draughty passage oh quite right thank you a thousand times she is deserving indeed of every delicate care and attention a slighter circumstance would have sufficed to confirm mrs simpson's romantic fancies she said to herself that mr rivers devotion was chivalrous indeed and she forthwith proceeded to sound mrs bransby's praises in an unbroken stream of eloquence all the way to blenheim lodge owen had intended to ask her one or two questions about mrs dobbs and as to what she thought of calling at mrs dormer smith's house he had even held a half-formed intention of entrusting her with a message for may but it was hopeless to arrest her flow of speech unless by making his request in a more serious fashion than he thought it prudent to do amelia's good will might be relied on but she was absolutely devoid of discretion and at all events if he said nothing there would be no ground for her to build a blunder on he little knew End of chapter 7